A doctor, an engineer, and a lawyer were sitting in a room trying to determine who was the first profession. The doctor said, well, um, God took a rib from Adam and fashioned Eve, so certainly the surgeon was the first profession. The engineer then said, God created heaven and earth from chaos and confusion. Therefore, the engineer must be the first profession. The lawyer very quietly said, who do you think created all the chaos and confusion? <laughs> so with that, uh, we'll get started. Uh, I'm going to talk here approximately um, 30 minutes, and then we'll save some time for questions and answers. We're going to cover here today licensure, credentialing and privileging, practitioner-patient relationship, and diagnosing and prescribing of medication, reimbursement, HIPAA, and I kick back in Stark laws. Um, any of you who know anything about these would know that each one of those six would probably be a half a day presentation. So we're going to do a 30,000 foot view, cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. CTEL's history, we are not a law firm. Uh, we don't play one on TV. Um, we do not provide legal advice. We're a nonprofit that was founded in 1995 to provide legal and regulatory research to the telemedicine community formerly known as the Center for Telemedicine Law, under the vision and leadership of the Mayo Foundation, the Cleveland Clinic, the Midwest Rural Telemedicine Consortium, Texas Children's Hospital, and our founder, Bob Waters. We cover a number of different issues in our research, physician nurse licensure, credentialing and privileging, telemedicine internet prescribing, Medicare reimbursement, private payer reimbursement, HIPAA privacy and compliance, referral restrictions, international maritime law, and industrial telemedicine. Um, I'm imagining that I'm sitting here at ATA, so I probably don't have to define these terms, but I do this when I do presentations just to make sure we're all on the same page, originating site, the location of the patient during the telemedicine encounter, and the distance site, the location of the specialist providing the service during the telemedicine encounter. Um, this, I also use these screens as simply to try, uh, mostly for audiences that are not telehealth experienced, um, and I'm sure people here are well into this, there are probably more uh, definitions of telehealth than exist in the face of the earth, but just to give a, a sense, um, telehealth is the broadest sense being picking up uh, email, faxes, electronic systems, remote patient monitoring devices. Telemedicine, uh, a more narrow slice using audio video uh, equipment per permitting two-way real-time interaction and communication between the patient and the physician and M Health, uh, uh, at, uh, incorporating such items as mobile phones and PDAs. Um, I just want to call your attention to the, our website at www.ctel.org. Um, there's a button on there with a three-minute movie, uh, The Day That Telehealth Saved Baby Malia's Life. Uh, baby Malia presented to a small hospital on the Oregon coast with an aggressive uh, uh, form of uh, uh, an infection. Um, the, special, the doctor at that small hospital had no idea what uh, they were dealing with and through telemedicine from OSHU in Portland, um, they were able to stabilize her and uh, airlift her to Portland. Um, unfortunately, Baby Malia lost her legs as a result of that encounter. Uh, but uh, her mother Ashley speaks very emotionally in the video about how her baby was saved and saved because of a telemedicine encounter. All right, when I'm talking to groups that don't know anything about telemedicine, I then say, okay, all of this sounds great. What's next? Why are there hurdles? We have licensure, we have credentialing and privileging, we have regulations in dealing with diagnosing and prescribing. We have reimbursement issues, privacy and security, and anti-kickback. And we're going to cover each one of those in just a few minutes. Licensure for telehealth. The main question that needs to be asked is where is the patient located? Uh, telehealth practitioners must meet the licensing requirements in the state in which they provide the services. Uh, answering the question, where is the patient located? Um, as uh, folks who are in telehealth know full well, um, licensure requirements are different for each state. All states require medical licensure. Um, let me put the qualifier on this that um, we are just now coming out of uh, legislature season. Uh, in my home state of South Dakota, we call it the silly season. 
Um, and uh, so uh, all of these numbers that you're going to see here that are reflective of states, uh, uh, number of states, are basically subject to change at a moment's notice. We're in the process now of, of, of double backing through all legislative action. Um, there is even one state that made a change between the time that I sent the slides to Roger and today. Um, so um, these numbers will give you a snapshot that was available at that point in time. Ten states have a telemedicine or a special licensure process. Forty-six states require licensure in another locality in order to provide telemedicine across state lines. Here is the list um, as of the time we did it uh, of the states that either have a telemedicine license procedure or a special license procedure um, through which telemedicine can be practiced. And you'll see those states there. The medical boards may take it a next step and they may require for special telemedicine license procedures, they may require other conditions uh, for that special license that the physician maintain a full medical license in another state, that there be no ethics violations and that they must not have an in-state office, uh, which is something that happens with some frequency. And let me just say, if anybody has a question, I'll try to entertain any questions as we go along and I'll still try to keep on track for the presentation, so feel free to give out. All states have various permeations of uh, what we call licensure exceptions. Um, they generally fall into things like this. For example, a state will allow for an exception to, for licensure for something like a resident in training. Um, some states have exceptions for uh, licensure on, for border states so that doctors in bordering states have some flexibility to come over without being licensed. U.S. military and VA physicians, they, VA and U.S. Uh, DOD have their own licensure process. Uh, public health services, medical emergencies. And then the one that is most frequent to questions to CTEL, which is the physician-to-physician -physician consultation. What, what constitutes a physician-to-physician -physician consultation? Almost all states have some permeation of the language, infrequent or occasional consultations are permitted. The question then comes down uh, that the lawyers wrestle with is, well, okay, well, how do you define infrequent or how do you define uh, occasional? And unfortunately, most states don't define. Uh, seven states do provide some definition to occasional and infrequent, and I'll give you three there. Delaware specifically says fewer than 12 consults per year. New Mexico, no more than 10 patients per year. And Wyoming, not more than 12 days in any 52-week period. Now, again, I'm kind of guessing that these exception laws were written well before the widespread use of telemedicine, and we're envisioning... Um, consultation laws pre-telemedicine. So that's why you see things like 10 patients per year, I think, was, would probably be reflective of that. Now I'd like to just give you some specific state examples. Um, here in Iowa, um, they permit uh, a physician to be incidentally called into a scenario where the Iowa physician requests the consulting medical services of an out-of-state physician. Um, the consulting physician is not permitted to perform medical procedures and the consulting physician cannot practice in Iowa for a period greater than 10 days and not more than 20 days in a calendar year. Here's Missouri. Um, consultation is okay as long as the Missouri licensed physician retains the ultimate authority and responsibility for the patient's care. There are no specific restrictions but placed on the consultation exception beyond that. Illinois. Um, I won't read all this. I will call your attention to the second to last follow-up care where the initial treatment occurred outside of Illinois. Um, we occasionally receive questions from people saying um, if a doctor uh, established a physician-patient relationship in a state and the, and the patient traveled, like say for example to Florida, um, am I allowed to continue providing coverage? Um, not many states specifically have identified this, but I pull this here because, uh, in fact, Illinois is one of those states that does specifically allow an exam a, a relationship to be established out of state and for that out of state physician to be able to carry it into Illinois, provided there's ongoing care. And finally, Kansas is pretty 
uh, vague here, um, incidentally called into the state of Kansas and incidentally is not defined. Let me take a moment and talk about consulting versus practicing. Um, I've gotten into more arguments with uh, doctors um, um, about what is a consultation versus when are they actually practicing medicine. Um, they have a little different view of consultation than sometimes I think state medical boards would have and we try to explain that to them. But the one point, and this was a point that was made by a high-ranking doctor official at the Joint Commission in a webinar we had about three years ago. He cautioned those of us in telemedicine to be very careful that the encounter basically isn't so far out of line, whether it's an out-of-state doctor trying to avoid licensure and using consultation, or whether it's an in-state doctor who wants to actually diagnose and prescribe without having established the physician-patient relationship, which I will explain here in a minute. What he basically said is you can't have the encounter between the specialist and the, and the person with the patient so and out of line that it isn't that it isn't really an it isn't really a a, a, a a it isn't really a consultation and I'll give you an example of what I mean in telemedicine if the scale is equal there's no real need to have telemedicine so the scale is always going to be a little bit out of balance but you can't have it so out of balance that the physician really isn't consulting but directing the care. Let's say you've got a pediatric cardiologist communicating to a nurse practitioner who's at the bedside of a baby. And the pediatric cardiologist says, um, I think we should give the baby X, Y, and Z. Well, is that nurse practitioner going to tell the pediatric cardiologist, uh, no, madam, doctor pediatric cardiologist, I don't agree with you, I'm not going to do it? So in that particular case, the pediatric cardiologist isn't really consulting, they're really directing the patient's care and therefore are the other aspects of the law being applied. Okay? So just something to be careful about as you do your, um, as you set up your encounters. Credentialing and privileging. Um, I won't take a whole lot of time on this because it's really something that since the uh, um, CMS modified their credentialing and privileging rules about uh, three years ago, um, we hardly get any questions on. We worked very closely with the Joint Commission and CMS to uh, get these uh, uh, guidelines in place. One thing that wasn't commonly known is people back in 2004 when the Joint Commission formed their uh, telemedicine guidelines, uh, people who were using those telemedicine guidelines thought they were legal. Um, CMS had never recognized the Joint Commission's uh, uh, telemedicine by proxy process. So if a hospital that was ever using the Joint Commission guidelines got surveyed by CMS, they would have been cited for a violation of CMS requirements. Um, won't get into all the details, but uh, CMS and Joint Commission came under the same umbrella, and uh, as a result of that, the Joint Commission and the CMS are at the same, on the same page. Originating site hospitals can rely on distance site hospitals for credentialing and privileging. The distance site can either be a Medicaid, Medicare participating hospital or a telemedicine entity. There has to be a written agreement between the two institutions. Um, and then there are some things that have to be part of the agreement. Um, uh, the distance site practitioner must be privileged at the distance site hospital. Um, the hospital provides a list of all the uh, privileges. Um, some other guidelines here just so we can keep moving in the presentation. We have information on our Credentialing and Privileging Resource Center at CTEL.org. Um, the only question that has really come up in the last couple years, and I have gone out on multiple occasions and tried to find if there was room for a webinar on this topic, and it's been cricket silence, so I take that to be that Credentialing and Privileging has been working fine. The one question that, I've got, that we've gotten that we've taken back to CMS is the following. We've gotten questions from organizations that the distance site and the originating site are legally organized between the two of them in such a way that it's not clear whether the distance site practitioner needs to be credentialed and privileged at the originating site because of the legal relationship between the two facilities. And basically what CMS told us is to ask the question if that same doctor 
got in his car, her car, and drove to the parking lot where the patient was and walked through the front door, would that doctor have to be specially credentialed and privileged at that site? And if the answer is no, because of the legal construction of the two, that the credentialing and privileging at the one building carries into the other, then there's no need to go through credentialing and privileging. If, however, that doctor driving into the parking lot would have to be credentialed and privileged, if the bylaws and the, and the guidelines, then that would have to be done. All right, now we're going to come to the, uh, the uh, sticky wicket here, and I'm surprised I don't have armed guards here because at ATA right now with everything that's going on in the telemedicine world, um, I should have probably armed guards. And that is the issue of physician-patient relationship. Um, how far can a practitioner go in diagnosing and treating a patient without having an established physician-patient relationship? Um, prescribing statutes were written well before the widespread use. And when I'm talking about prescribing statutes now for, for purposes of this discussion, I'm not talking about controlled substances because controlled substances takes on a whole different matter you got federal law as well as state law overlapping. So we're talking about non-controlled substances. 42 states require that a physical exam or a pre-existing physician-patient relationship be established. The problem is that states use vague language. Can a face-to-face -face or an in-person examination occur through telemedicine? And how do you define telemedicine? Um, there are 19 states that allow for a physical exam to be conducted electronically. And I want to caution everybody here because many people, probably some vendors in this hallway, look at this list and they say, oh my God, we're good to go. All right. Each one of these has an asterisk on them. All right. Texas, for example, has a location requirement. So telemedicine can be done, but the, the patient has to be in a specific location to be able to utilize telemedicine. North Carolina had pretty clear statutes that allowed for electronic examination, and they have pulled back a little bit now, and they are reviewing their uh, guidelines. And so North Carolina Medical Board has basically said, we, we urge everybody to have an in-person examination and not through telemedicine. Oklahoma, I don't know what the latest statute on this, but when I talked to them about a month or so ago, their, their information had to go before their legislature and their medical board, so they're in the process. So each one of these operates just a little bit differently. So you can't just look at that list and say, let's run. 30 states require a patient medical history. 29 states allow for emergency prescribing in specific search situations, 36% specifically prohibit medical questionnaires and or patient supplied history as the sole basis for the prescription. Again, if some of this was done back during the internet pharmacy world, and so this is a little bit of a legacy on that. Let me give you some state examples. Uh, in Missouri, a valid physician-patient relationship shall include uh, the performing of a physical exam in a patient adequate to establish the diagnosis uh, et cetera, et cetera. I talked to just somebody from Missouri here today. Missouri Medical Board, um, according to her, recognizes that electronic examination. Um, they have specifically um, said that telephone examinations are not allowed uh, and are in some action right now. Iowa uh, Medical Board requires a prescriber patient relationship to exist before the patient can diagnose and treat. Uh, prescription can't be valid without a valid relationship based on solely internet questionnaires. Internet consultation or telephone consultations are not valid. So it would appear to me by that language that establishing a, uh, a physician-patient relationship over the telephone would not be allowed and one would have to try to figure out what they mean by internet consultation. Kansas does not have a specific telemedicine statute or a state board on policy on prescribing. They evaluate their issues case by case. Um, we've been at this since 2011. Um, in 2011, we did our first ever uh, prescribing report. We researched all 50 state laws, um, determined which states required an in-person examination, which ones uh, could be done through telemedicine. Um, 
worked with the Federation of State Medical Boards and uh, got it into the hands of all 50 medical boards who signed off on our research and information. At that time, we identified 12 to 13 states that allowed for a telemedicine examination through two-way video. Again, restating my asterisk there. As a result of that report, the CTEL board prepared language that we sent to all 50 state medical boards because we thought there needed to be some clarity as to what um, could and could not be done through telemedicine. The major points of the, of the language we sent to medical boards were that number one, legally recognize an examination through telemedicine technology that provides the physician with information that is equal to or superior to an in-person examination. Number two, it has to conform to the standard of care. Number three, peripherals and diagnostic tests must be included sufficient to provide an accurate diagnosis. Telephone calls and emails are not allowed to establish a physician-patient relationship. And regulatory compliant on-call coverage uh, is permitted, provided that it's legal and regulatory compliant. There's a reason why I specifically used the words that I used. There are some creative uses of on-call language out there. So um, we've been following this issue and, and I think when you get to the issue of standard of care, um, this, is the real, um, this is the real issue. These are the conversations we've had with medical boards. Um, doctors have a difference of opinion um, as to what can and cannot be done through a, um, a, an examination. Um, so we ask medical boards the following question. If, a, if, a, if an encounter is supposed to meet or exceed an in-person examination using peripherals and diagnostic tests, can an examination through one of these mediums conform to the standard of care? Can a practitioner, number one, look into a patient's mouth using a webcam or a phone app and a smartphone flashlight and accurately diagnose strep throat? Can a patient talk to a, can a doctor talk to a patient over telephone and diagnose a UTI or an ear infection without having looked at the ear? Can you use a phone app to diagnose conjunctivitis? And no, this is not a typo. Um, can you diagnose breast pain through a web portal? There is a company that advertises in their business model um, that they one of the issues that they will address is breast pain and breast infection. Um, you can't make it up. So I guess, um, I'm, I already jumped ahead, but I wanted just to conclude this part of it. People made me wonder, and why do we beat this drum? Why are we beating this drum? We're beating this drum for two reasons, one of which is antibiotic overprescribing. Um, we, we, are, we, are, we are becoming educated to this every day. Um, the CDC presented on a webinar for us back in January, um, and they were very clear in saying that there is only one way to diagnose um, UTI, confirm a diagnosis of UTI and strep throat, and it's not over a webcam or a telephone. Um, we've talked to ENT uh, 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 professionals who say no examination of the year means no examination means no prescription. And so um, we're very concerned about the issue of antibiotic overprescribing. Second of all, um, is the issue of regulations. Right now, uh, telemedicine is sexy in the press. Um, isn't it wonderful? Mama's baby wakes up at nine o'clock on a Friday night, has an ear infection. Um, she goes to the credit card, she puts it in. 30 minutes later, she gets a call from a doctor and the doctor diagnoses baby's ear infection over the telephone. Now, press story is, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it convenient, less costly, et cetera? Um, what happens when doctor misdiagnoses baby? Um, I worked on Capitol Hill for 28 years. I know a little bit about how regulations and laws come down. Um, the story headline will not be doctor didn't conform to the standard of care. The story headline will be telemedicine killed baby. Um, and we've seen two examples of that just recently. Oklahoma had a story about Skype in the headline a uh, little, little attention to the doctor and what he did. And there was just an encounter in Idaho uh, where a doctor in Wyoming was providing telephone medicine service into Idaho. The headline was Idaho Board Rejects Telemedicine. 
Well, the Idaho Board didn't reject telemedicine. The Idaho Board had a problem with a doctor and how they were doing their business. So all that we would say to you at this point, we'll move on, is we're very concerned about the ramifications and doctors say um, it's only, it's not a matter of if, but when. And in conclusion on that part, one chief medical officer told me from the medical board, um, if they're doing it, if you can think of it, they're doing it. And if they aren't doing it, they're gonna be doing it soon. With that, we'll go on to reimbursement. Uh, Medicare statute, uh, again, we're gonna give the highlight here. In 2013, uh, Medicare reimbursed approximately 11.8 million under the Medicare physician fee schedule. Um, in 2001, when the statute was passed by Congress, CBO estimated that it would be 150 billion, 150 million over five years or 30 million a year. So here we are in 2013, and that's still how far off we are uh, based on that. With regard to the process for, for reimbursement, um, there are some things that are set, set by statute and cannot be changed except by Congress. The originating site locations, the um, list of practitioners that are eligible, um, there's a definition of rural urban that is set by statute, uh, and finally, the specific codes are the only thing that CMS has flexibility to create uh, uh, every year in the physician fee schedule. So if you have a code that you think is something uh, that you want CMS to consider, I would urge you to do it. They seem to be very serious about this. Um, they take it serious. You, if you just read the stuff that they put out, um, they follow it very carefully. Medicaid. 45 states, I think there actually are more since we did that, that provide uh, various aspects of uh, telehealth services. 21 states um, mandate private payer telehealth coverage, meaning if uh, the policy that you have uh, covers an in-person encounter and the physician believes it can be done through telemedicine, then the, the insurance company has to reimburse or cannot discriminate by paying for telemedicine. More and more states are starting to get into this. Okay, here's my favorite one, HIPAA. Um, lawyers have funded college educations on HIPAA. Um, so this is going to be an overview. I am not a lawyer and it's not on my bucket list, let me assure you. The important thing to remember here is that um, uh, there are two aspects of, of HIPAA, privacy rule and security rule. Privacy rule establish standards for the protection of information and the security rule sta uh, pr provides a set of national standards for the information as it's transmitted in electronic form. Covered entities include healthcare providers, health plans, and healthcare clearinghouses. Basic principle uh, uh, that um, and I'm, give you credit. My, uh, I should notify here that uh, Renee Kwashi from Epstein, Becker and Green uh, is a CTEL legal resource team member and uh, has been active and, and, uh, and, and assisted greatly in the preparation of these slides because of his expertise. I'm glad to have him in the audience here today. Um, basic principle for the privacy rule, uh, define and limit the circumstances in which a protected health information can be disclosed. Uh, you'll see some information there as far as under what, in, uh, under what circumstances. The important thing here is minimum necessary use and disclosure. There are a number of things here that I won't go into detail with that are permitted as far as uh, use and disclosure. Covered entity requirements, designate a privacy official, develop written policies and procedures, sanction employees for violating policies, provide privacy training, et cetera. Um, I would add one on here that I should have had on here, and that is BYOD policies. Um, if your institution has not looked at a BYOD policy, it's important to remember that if there's a breach through somebody's uh, personal uh, data that's in the hospital or in the facility, um, that's just as dangerous as a breach elsewhere. Now we'll turn to the security rule. Security rule covers entities uh, in the protection and uh, of appropriate administrative, technical, and physical safeguards for EPHI. 
who is covered, health plans, health clearing houses, and to any health care provider who transmits. Three types of safeguards. You have to be able to deactivate access. You have to know when the activity is logged. Physical location of devices, and there's my BYOD. Uh, physical access to the systems and encryption. Um, as a wise council has uh, said on webinars, encryption is not mandated, but if you do not encrypt, it has to be part of your plan to explain why and what your procedures are to protect. Okay. Breach notification requires entities to report breaches of protected health information and covered entities are expected to report breaches they discover or through re reasonable diligence would have discovered. One thing to remember on privacy is that state privacy laws trump federal law if they are stronger. Um, that generally is not the case. Federal law usually trumps state laws, but in the case of privacy laws, so it's not just enough to look at the HIPAA requirements, you also have to look at state laws. Issues uh, unique to telehealth, um, um, business agreements, uh, a lot of changes in laws with related to business agreements, so it's very important that you uh, take a good look at the business agreements that you have out there or that you don't have out there and get them set up. Um, the use of, uh, and we use Skype, generically speaking, to say anything like that. Um, there's always a red flag and a caution. Um, I've heard a number of presentations on this topic that basically say the audit, the audit trail that must be done in order to prove a breach from beginning to end is very critical to a HIPAA policy process. And when you get into issues like Skype and, and other web-based systems, that's a key question that needs to be asked because the beginning to end can't be guaranteed. And I kick back, I'm gonna, ro I'm gonna roll through this very quickly, uh, provi prohibits offering and paying and soliciting and receiving of any remunerations for, uh, in return for business. And so we have to be very careful when we're providing telemedicine services that there isn't a change in, um, there isn't a change in uh, uh, service or change in, in uh, practice as a result of the inducement. Here are some questions you can ask yourself. Did something of value get offered? Did the provider's treatment pattern change? Were patients switched because of the kickback? If yes, were they consulted and told about the inducement? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, very careful. There are two uh, OIG HHS uh, advisory opinions, one of which is specifically on this issue that would be worth taking a look at. And finally, the Stark Law prohibits a physician from making referrals to any one of uh, a certain number of entities. Well, we're at the end. Um, unfortunately, with chaos and confusion, um, the concrete black and white that everybody might want is not there. Uh, whether it's the State Medical Board, whether it's a statute, it's just not there. You may think the statute or rule is stupid, as one person said to me. Um, my, opinion, my response to that was laughingly saying, your opinion doesn't count. But then I said, that's not actually true. Um, you have state legislators who are grappling with this. You have medical boards that are grappling with how to navigate this thicket of what we're seeing out there now. So people who are coming in with very serious uh, presentations and very serious information are taken seriously. I want to encourage everybody to incorporate legal and regulatory questions into your business model at the beginning, not at the end. Um, I couldn't tell you the number of times we get a call from a program where they're, re where they're ready to flip the switch and then somebody says, well, did anybody run the trap on this legal question? And that's the last thing you want to do. You want to incorporate the legal and regulatory problem issues early um, they won't go away if you don't address them. They only get worse. Thank you very much. If there's any questions, that would be fine. Uh, Greg's prepared to answer them. I have one question, Greg. Uh, the uh, Federation of State Medical Boards has recently approved, adopted the new policy guidelines for telemedic techno telemedicine technologies and the practice of medicine. Uh, how does their policy guidelines line up with the CTEL proposed legislative language? Um, 
very, very closely except for one very important uh, omission. Um, if you remember that our language says that um, diagnostic tests and peripherals need to be incorporated as necessary. Not every encounter is going to require a peripheral. Not every encounter is going to require a diagnostic test. But diagnostic tests and peripherals have to be available to the practitioner in order to have an encounter that conforms to the standard of care. The Federation left out reference to diagnostic tests and peripherals. And our concern is um, that we think, and it's uh, probably already been borne out in practical application, that entities um, who believe that all they merely need to do is have a webcam connection with the patient and they have met the standard of care, um, that that's, that's all they need to do. And it's our position that are, there are some things that you just, as I said earlier, you just can't diagnose over a webcam uh, or a tablet or an iPhone. I work for the VA and am the manager of a network of telemedicine systems. And so we have physicians in Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Florida, Alabama. And a couple of weeks ago, I got an inquiry from the field um, from one of the providers who said that part of his medical license renewal was a question from the State Board of Medical Licensure about the IP address of the unit he would be using for telemedicine. So I, I ran this up to the national office. No one had ever heard of a similar inquiry. I personally don't understand the motivation because there's not a commitment to him to always provide services from the same unit within our healthcare system. I just so I sent an, an inquiry back to him to ask for some additional information, the context in which that was asked, and if there was an actual form that had that a place, because I went through all their statutes and I couldn't find anything that said, oh yeah, part of your relicensure will be that you provide a CIP address of your unit. So I just wondered if anybody had encountered that. I've not heard that from another state. First time I've, okay. first time I've ever heard of that. Um, be willing to, we have pretty good relationships with medical boards, I'd be willing to, to talk to you further. It's in Mississippi. Mississippi. Okay. Go figure. All right. Stop it, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? You know, uh, let me just mention that, uh, you know, I'm asked, I mentioned the Federation of State Medical Board policy guidelines in telemedicine. As it turns out, tomorrow at 1215 here, we're going to have Jonathan Jagoda, who is the director of federal programs for the FSMB, here explaining the policy guidelines that were adopted in Denver about three or four weeks ago as well as the proposed interstate compact for physician licensure. Now, that's another question I'm going to pose to Greg. What is your opinion of the proposed compact? Well, um, I think our board feels that it doesn't go far enough in, uh, in recognizing the practice of medicine across state lines. Um, so from that vantage point, our, our uh, comments to the Federation uh, were along that lines, that it was a good first step. Um, we saw some logistical issues that might uh, might complicate the compact as far as the actual implementation of it. Um, we actually urged the Federation to put together a small working group of uh, people in the community and people who are affected by it um, to hopefully kind of look at their process and help move it along in as strong a way as possible. Um, I, I, I've heard from medical boards. Medical boards feel very strongly about protecting the patients of their state. Um, you know, it could be any number of reasons. I'm not going to sit here and defend medical boards and say that there aren't some, you know, uh, dollars and cents involved, that there aren't some uh, uh, practical applications. But I have heard some stories about um, uh, situations where doctors have been denied licenses in one state in the state where they graduated from their medical school um, and then they went to another state and got licensed without problems and so I think that there's some safety issues out there that really need to be thought about there's another issue that's out there that has showed up in a couple of pieces of legislation in Capitol Hill and that is the point of service 
Um, right now, the point of service, as I said earlier, is where the patient is located. Um, there's been some discussion, there's some legislation on Capitol Hill that would change the point of service to where the physician is located. Um, in an ideal world, that's probably the way it ought to be, uh, maybe. I mean, at least from the tele particularly a telemedicine's perspective. But when I put my former legislator hat, legislative staff hat on, and I try to figure out the implementation of changing the point of service to where the patient is located to where the doctor is located, um, I can't even wrap my head around it because you've got credentialing and privileging issues, you got liability issues that the lawyers, I'm sure, were going to be interested in if you change point of service to another state. Um, there are so many, um, so many aspects of that that would really be an issue. Even if there was a compact, and I don't exactly, would there be just one compact? In my head, I was thinking there were going to be these regional compacts, but somebody else listened to it and they said, no, no, they're talking about one compact. It's been a long time since I looked at it. But I it is one compact. One. Okay. So, but then they said that um, the each state medical board could still charge for that license. Yes. yes. So, um, that's a big disadvantage for some physician who's wanted to practice all over. I can answer this. Oh. Basically, what the compact would do would be to set up an expedited path for licensure. Uh, the state medical boards in a compact in compact states can still charge a fee, but the I think there will be um, I don't know if you could say pressure, but encouragement to charge less for that kind of compact license than they would charge a doctor for a regular license in their state. Uh, but again, everything is voluntary. Uh, no state has to join, but I think there will be, if, if it does go through, there have seven states lined up to join right now. And then I've, I would just think people would follow suit after those first seven, because again, there's an advantage to being in the compact, and that's why other states will want to do that. And going to what Roger just said about streamlining the process, I mean, probably things like asking for an IP address would probably go to the wayside. Um, I had one, maybe one forum. I had one, um, one uh, company that did licensure for a number of their practitioners who told me that there was a physician that was in their practice who was a veterinarian uh, before he returned to medical school, got his medical degree, and he had been practicing for like 10 or 15 years, and he went to get a license in this state, and that state required him to get all of his veterinarian license information to submit to the medical board. Um, you know, I mean, this wasn't just a brand new doc, you know, I mean, he had been, in, he had, he had been a veterinarian, then he'd been a doc for like 10 years, with a track record in history, yet this medical board wanted the veterinary information. I got a feeling a compact would probably not have veterinary information included in it. At least I would hope not. I have one more question. Uh, are you, you're familiar with Alaska and what the legislature did there, approving the uh, idea of providing prescriptions to patients who call, an, uh, unknown patients, who call a physician and describe their complaint and then are able to get prescriptions over the phone. And the only protection is that the patient must agree that the information in that healthcare interaction be sent to his primary care provider. Now that to me sounds like you could drive a truck through that loophole. Well, interestingly enough, um, we were consulted by uh, a staff person of the legislature uh, on this particular, when they were drafting the legislation, and we uh, shared with them CTEL's position that we are not sure that a doctor can diagnose a patient over a telephone. Um, so we, we, we shared with him all the things. Um, the only part of it that made it somewhat tolerable um, was that he described aspects of Alaska that probably most people would not even be thinking about. Um, villages where people have to get uh, in a boat and travel by boat, you know, two or three hours to a clinic uh, to a point where they hoard, the staffer was saying, that they save their unused, they don't take their full antibiotic prescriptions, they save half of them, they put them in the medical cabinet so they don't have to get out. So 
we were not, we didn't agree with it. We told them we had a problem with it, but yes. Um, I don't know if there are gonna be other states. I kind of think that that's probably gonna be an outlier, um, but uh, you know, who knows. Um, this was something that came up at the Federation's annual meeting because the Federation language specifically said, as did CTEL's language, that you can esta cannot establish that physician-patient relationship for the first time encounter over a telephone, and they had no telephone in the language. Um, Federation said for the first time in the history they had outside people testifying uh, before their boards, and there were a number of patient advocacy groups who were there um, who were concerned that what that meant was in, that their patients could never talk to a doctor over the phone. And, you know, when I got a call on Saturday morning on that, I said, you, you know, I mean, once the physician-patient relationship is established, the doctor can communicate with the patient by smoke signals, by paper airplane, by, you know, whatever the doctor feels will meet the, you know, the, 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 the criteria. Um, but unfortunately, these groups were, I don't know if they were, I don't, I don't know how they got the information they received, but it unfortunately was inaccurate. Uh, because the Federation's position was not to deal with a patient who wanted to talk to their own doctor on the phone. It was going to a first-time encounter. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Greg, we want to thank you for thank you. coming here and presenting you, for us.